A warm welcome to the respectful NetTheater channel. Today is the 8th of February, 2022. Our today's episode is about performing artificial intelligence, techno-human agencies and interventions. Our guests are, just to present them shortly, the artists Marco Donnarumma and Stefan Baumann, both specialists in performing our AI. We have with us the scholars in cultural education and media studies, Benjamin Jörissen and Martin Donner, both from Friedrich Alexander University Erlang Nürnberg. And I'm very happy to welcome my dear colleague, Irina Kaldrak, who is a media scholar with a background in mathematics. The episode is hosted by Ilya Mirsky, dramaturg, programmer, immersive media artist and lecturer, and at, uh, dramaturg at Zimmertheater in Tübingen, and myself, Martina Leker, a scholar in media and theater studies and a performer. Before going more deeper into our topic, let me shortly introduce the Respectful Net Theater channel to you. This is a freelance project by Judith Ackermann, Anusha Gosalka, Kai Tuchmann, and myself. And it attempts to understand the role of the digital in theater and performance in and for digital cultures. We do so in conversation with artists from theater performance and scholars from the humanities or technical sciences. On the other side, we also explore very practically the performative possibilities and regimes of digital environments. This becomes concrete on our digital stage on TikTok. Let's go a bit deeper into our topic. Artificial intelligence is an important issue because devices equipped with, this, with it, we are able for collecting data and processing them with algorithms. They are building our cultures in a large sense, namely our conditions of life. Artificial intelligence is, for example, defining what we are addressing, what we know and understand by choosing and sorting data for us. Furthermore, they define how we commu communicate and how we organize society, eco economy and politics. These powers make technical things and humans uh, that they are today interdependently entangled. So it is about a techno-human agency or assemblage. It is obvious that it becomes essential to understand how artificial intelligence function, which agencies they have, or which we attach to them discursively, and which agency and influence human have. Therefore, our session on performing AI asks for its operative performances and how these perform humans and vice versa, how humans make AI perform and perform it. Within the performing AI, a regime of intermingled adaption and anticipation comes up. This orientation builds the basis for concepts, methods, and aesthetics of interventions in performing, in performing artificial intelligence, if ever they throw human beings into technocratic and inhuman regimes. Our guests are experts for a profound exchange on the possible human and technological agencies and the options of intervening in performing AI. Our reference point will be the work of the artists. Stefan Baumann is with us as an expert in AI and an artist in music, passionate by techno, modular techno and interactive sound installations, holding a PhD in music and artificial intelligence research. He works in Berlin and Kaiserslautern at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. His expertise and interest in artificial intelligence lies firstly in music recommendation systems, an area he is teaching or he was teaching at the Pop Academy Baden-Württemberg till 2018. The crucial point, as I understood it, for our topic is his interest in making algorithmic procedures visible. Secondly, he's also interested in artificial intelligence and music creativity. His position is, quote, the machine does not understand the meaning of life and death. We as musicians make music to compensate for our feelings or just to have fun, but the machine doesn't care. So we have to ask, 
what sense should there be in machines doing compos composing for us? The only benefit could be that a professional composer could stop writing boring music for mass audiences. So I don't see a dis dis dystop dystopian future coming, but very, very advanced musical tools." End quote. Marco Donnarumma also follows an aesthetic and met methodology to discuss the techno-human relation and agencies and to intervene into them. He does so as an artist, performer, stage director, engineer and programmer, as well as a scholar, weaving together contemporary performances, new media art and interactive computer music since the early 2000s. Paradigmatically, it is his performance series, Human Methods. He says on his website, quote, the project reflects on how presently env environmental destruction and socio-political polarization converge with artificial intelligence in a new way of violence, an algorithmic brutalization of everything that lives. Human methods poetically reflects on this from a violence of this, uh, reflects on this form of violence by immersing the audience in the perspective of the bodies, human and non-human, that experience it. It is an aesthetic research into how a synthesis of symbols, movements, music, and AI can enable posthuman forms of empathy." End quote. Benjamin Jorsen's work on media and culture uh, education is trendsetting, as he doesn't demonize them, but he is looking for their operative procedures and their cultural effects as a chance for education. His specific interest is in aesthetic practices as repetition, iteration, or remix and cultural hacking in order to come to a comprehension as well as to transformation of symbolic and cultural orders within techno-cultural conditions, which lie today beyond human understanding. He, is, um, no, he holds the share of education with a focus on culture and aesthetics as well as the UNESCO chair at University Erlang Nuremberg, focusing on the significance of artistic educational processes um, for cultural transformation as in his function as UNESCO chairholder. Martin Donner joins us as a scholar in media studies and cultural education and as an award-winning electro electronic composer, currently assistant at University Erlang Nuremberg. Among a lot of other interests, he's a specialist in cybernetics and for the countercultural neo avant-garde of the 1960s and its effects on today's digital cultures, asking for its interventionist potential concerning critical concepts of subjectivity and subjectivation. Irina Kaldrak comes to us ex with her expertise in artificial intelligence from the point of view of media studies as shown in her edited volume, Künstliche Intelligenzen, from 2019, part of the prestigious Zeitschrift für Medienwissenschaft, published together with Christoph Ernst, Jens Schröter, and Andrea Sudmann. This book offers a basic and trendsetting overview for our today's media cultures of artificial intelligence, as the editors, editors put it. Her recent publications show her interest and expertise in interventions in digital cultures. The volume, Throwing Gestures, Protest, Economy and the Imperceptible, deals with condition of resistance in digital cultures. The forthcoming volume, Preferable, Prefer, Preferable Futures, Transformation Design in Digital Cultures, comes up with options for media studies to join practically for other futures within today's crisis of the Anthropocene. Oops. The topic, um, also, um, and I want to, um, to give a hint on her professional career. Irina substituted the professorship, Cultures of Knowledge and the Digital Age in Braunschweig University of Art since February this year She's a professor at Foreign Studies College, Hunan Normal University, Changcha in China. We will start with our short inputs. 
of about five minutes by our guests, beginning with Stefan and Marco, followed with inputs by the scholars Benjamin, Martin, and then finally Irina. And after the inputs, we will start our conversation. The stage is yours, Stefan. Thanks a lot. So five minutes is very short, um, but but the topic is so broad. And since we don't know each other uh, in detail, I thought some colorful slides could help. And that's why I would like to show you this one here. Let's see. So do you have it full screen? Yes. Everybody? OK. So yeah, I'm in AI research since 30 years. I'm a musician since 50 years, kind of semi-professional musicians, I would say since 10 to 15 years. So I would say, unfortunately, I spend more time on AI than on music, but uh, fortunately there is enough overlap in between them. So to heat up a little bit the discussion, <clears throat> I just wanted to make a, a very fast uh, introduction wrap up of, of, of my thoughts in, in very short detail. So the field is, is very old, uh, heavily underestimated in the beginnings, having nowadays a real huge breakthrough in commercial stuff, especially within deep learning. Um, nevertheless, um, if, if we see AI applied in the arts, I often have the feeling that we could use very early uh, Kubernetes of Wiener or Breitenberg vehicles, like very small toys to achieve the same effect by mimicking social and human behavior. Um, this interest in applying AI to decode musical genius, it's kind of meanwhile uh, old, I mean, 20 years ago, Wittmer already did uh, this work about decoding the Horowitz factor by analyzing um, you know, piano performance by machine learning methods. Uh, 10 years later, um, Pache created this kind of uh, continuator app, which uh, passed really successfully with the musical Turing test. So experts couldn't even distinguish between a professional jazz player and the machine. Um, that's jump to nowadays, if, if we look at um, most uh, welcome AI using artists, uh, Holly Herndon might be for sure the it girl of the moment using um, self-trained AI generating music machine only on her voice and trying out new ways of interacting with the audience, like uh, collecting the audience voices, improvising on it and so forth. Um, if we take a step into core AI research um, and see about the success of the Alpha Zero board games playing software of Google DeepMind, here you can see really artificial creativity which might be a little bit creepy instead of doing style transfers, analyzing human behavior, etc., which have, as I have shown in the previous examples, I would say here is something which uh, I would be interested in to look uh, when asking if AI can really support um, creativity or show up a new aesthetics of very own artificial creativity. So for my impression, this AI craziness, it's, it's mundane. This is the example of a one week student task, which uh, I, I gave to a student last year. So she was able to write the emotional AI music classifier with in one week. So um, it's available for everybody who's a little bit interested. And that's why I would say um, it's okay to apply these methods, um, but I still wait for, I would say more interesting stuff. Um, Coming to my bit of musical and artistic works, this is an old example, it's of 2005. So we brought an interactive real garden of sound flowers into a, into a hall in our town, creating kind of a holistic experience with olfactory stuff even though we had real role 
um, green inside the hall, etc. And these flowers were uh, reacting interactively to people passing by by using music retrieval methods. Then I was collecting, uh, as a lot of people do, field recording stuff in Portugal, empowered by an EU fund. And uh, in addition, I was recording my biophysical reaction with this kind of uh, little teeny tiny prototype. I was recording sounds in the gigahertz uh, field by using this scanner on the left. And then I was creating compositions with it, bringing them even to stage 10 years later in the theater. Um, this is my current setup. I refuse completely to use AI laptops, etc. Going back to uh, analog modular stuff, which is yeah, it's which is pretty on vogue in the dance, techno, house music scene, Berlin-based stuff. So this is again not really something very exciting for electronic music experts, but for me, it's kind of refusing the aesthetics of the laptop and the aesthetics of AI generated stuff uh, by using this playground to create my very own music. And very recently, I gave AI a chance. I was just using modules from startups which are lying around, you can play around with, to create some little popish tunes, including Michael Jackson. So I used the lyrics generator, I used the Michael Jackson voice generator. Um, I just played around with, mid, with it to be surprised on my own. So in the beginning, it was just a play, but in the end, I ended up in really using parts of it. And I plan to do a release um, and it will be interesting to see how many legal issues, et cetera, will evolve by using these little tools because, um, I mean, copyright holders, gamer stuff is still not on, on track for these times. So I hope I'm still in the five minutes and that's it. And I still wonder by citing this very old slide of Masahiro Mori robotic sky about the uncanny valley. So I don't know where we actually are in these days. So um, have we still passed the uncanny valley? Do these AI influenced artifacts already feel so human like that we don't even ask anymore if it's creepy? Or are we still kind of in it? I don't know. This might be just an impulse for the upcoming discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Marco for his input. So I was not planning to, but since Stefan did share some nice images, I will do probably the same since we are only two artists here. So. Thanks, Stefan. I was just planning on talking, but it probably makes sense uh, to show just, I would just show some images just so we get an idea of what the stuff that I'm on. And um, yeah, briefly, so I work with, uh, with AI since about 10 years now, um, mostly in performance, uh, music, and um, interactive mechanism. And I'm generally not very interested in what AI can generate because so far it's all based on imitation mechanism. Um, there is a bit of, of research also into AI generating new material from scratch, but it's not very exciting yet, at least in my opinion. And all of the stuff that it's based on, 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 on sampling and so forth. Um, again, it, it, it doesn't interest me personally, which is not to say that it's not interesting. It's just very different from the stuff that I do. So what I try to focus more on is, is I, I take some question from, from, from theory, from cultural studies, uh, especially in relation to, to critical theory and the body. And, and I try to ask myself a question about, about AI from this point of view. And um, so just to make these words a little more concrete. 
I'll just show you my website quickly. And so this, this for instance, called Ominous. It's uh, the first performance where um, I managed to implement a decent AI system. Um, at the time, you would not call it AI system. You would call it just machine learning, which is very different. Uh, maybe that's also something we can talk about later. Um, and yeah, this was this was so-called gestural music performance. So I was playing music with the uh, with the biophysical sensor uh, that I created myself ten years ago, and the uh, data from from my body, uh, from muscles contraction of my body, were sent to the machine, which in this case was just uh, doing listening and support for the performance. So it would just listen to my movement and and allow me to go through different section of a piece based on the way i was moving in a, in a specific performance uh, so nothing too complicated but more using ai as a support for the show then um, some years later i did this this piece called corpus deal where still using different biosensor capturing muscle sounds and electrical micro voltages from the body feeding it again to a machine with machine learning algorithms but here the system was a bit more sophisticated and uh, it was designed in a way so that it could um, improvise certain type of music along with my movements and responding to my movements um, saying very roughly and then moving forward, then I, I just started to feel the need of embodying this algorithm somehow in, in something, uh, because performing with a computer is cool, but if you are a body performer that does a lot of, of body work like I do, then at some point you will be a bit bored of having only partners that are chips. And uh, so with, uh, with a team of people, we designed a series of, of prostheses. Uh, you can see one here. Uh, oh yeah, here you can see it better. Um, but these were based on the concept of, of a useless prosthesis. So it's not a prosthesis that I, the wearer, the wearer but actually it takes away capability from it. So in this case, this is a fascial prosthesis that uh, take away my gaze as it has this species of, it's a fascial prosthesis with an arm coming out of your face. So it just block your gaze while at the same time giving you another sense of, of, of uh, touch through the motors of the machine itself. And these machines, then we made six of them are all different and they're all customized to different performers body that I worked with. And, um, the, the basic principle is that they, they self-generate their movement and then uh, uh, this movement is adaptive in response to the movement of the wearer. And to do this, we, we used uh, some a biometric algorithm and some, um, uh, and some machine learning. And then uh, just finally, uh, the work with Fronte Vacuo, which is the artist group that I co-founded with Margherita Pever and Andrea Familari in, in, in the end of 2019. And uh, with them, as maybe someone may have guessed from uh, the quote that Martina read from, from uh, our website, we're not looking exclusively at AI, but we're actually trying to position AI within this conversion of, of, of uh, polarization and, uh, and climate devastation. Um, because it, it, it's all interconnected. It's also extremely complex. Uh, so we're not really aiming to explain it all, but we just dive deep into some very peculiar aspect of it that have to do with loop, with repetition, with aggression, how these concepts then are at the base of many developments uh, of, of modern AI, which is not only deep learning made by Google and all the other corporation, although that's what people, uh, most people uh, tend to think of when we mention AI these days. So for instance, uh, this, this performance or uh, part of our Humane Method series 
So here there is this figure uh, without a face and looking like a saint alien or something uh, that basically has to keep on doing a prayer uh, forever in a loop uh, along a vertical path. And then in front of the performer, there is a camera, which uh, is part of a computer-based uh, AI, uh, computer vision-based AI system. They try to recognize the shape, the shape of the body of the performer, but at the same time, illuminates the body of the performer with some lighting. And so it, we created this feedback loop where the machine tries to learn the shape, but it can't really ever learn it because it keeps illuminating the more it learns. Um, so it, in a similar vein, but in a more sophisticated um, environment, uh, there is uh, this piece Exhale, which we just premiered in Berlin. And we are going on tour this, this week and the next month. And here uh, we use a, um, a more updated version of our um, AI computer vision system. Uh, and this time um, the performance takes place in a garden-like environment where it's full of rubbish and plant and, and machines and human beings and fungi and stuff. And uh, the AI is, is overlooking the whole place through cameras that are distributed in the space. And then it try to recognize shapes and figures and then try to isolate anomalies from, from the things that happen. Uh, but here as well, we use this feedback system with lights and we also use it with sound uh, this time. And we have the performers and the AI uh, executing uh, small loops in, the, in, in synchronization um where the eye makes light and sound and the performers makes movement and um, the whole thing is basically just a living big system that uh feeds itself through repetition that um through repetition and difference so by repeating the same thing over and over differences emerges and then thousands of different micro stories emerge and the audience is immersed inside the set, so they are part of themselves of, of this um, system. So I think, I guess this has already taken my five minutes, so we we'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marco. And um, as yeah, inputs of, of the callers, I would like to ask Benjamin Jorissen. Thank you very much. So what Marco is showing us, I think, is right what I would be heading towards, but from a different perspective. So I think um, this kind of work or this this work that we saw um, is a very, very important one. And uh, and but I will, will try to to motivate this from my perspective, which is not arts, but education and not artistic research, but scientific research. So this is a change of field, of course, and perspectives. But I, I hope that in the end, it will be clear why uh, these kind of projects really matter um, to us as a, yeah, as a kind of light tower, so to say, to to gain some orientation in the field. So, my perspective, uh, I'm I'm working very much on dig digitalization in uh, the fields of arts education, um, and uh, and also um, uh, about uh, mediality or digitality uh, with regard to subjectivity, meaning how our mediatization and dig digitalization would change ourselves as a sub as, as subjects uh, that we are. Subjects are not um, not uh, not um, uh, crafted in, in in stone, but historically very much uh, transformative. Uh, we are quite transformative beings uh, as subjects. So my perspective is from the educational uh, stu uh, software studies, especially uh, on on AI. And uh, I would uh, um, start to uh, beginning to, to, to remember um, some uh, some um, thoughts about software from the uh, software studies discourse. Uh, for example, that software in itself. So if, if we if we take AI as a form of software, and we first ask what what the uh, properties of software are, and then ask what AI is, uh, what what's new with AI with regard to that, then then uh, we we could say that software. Um, is the, uh, always a, a powerful, a power-laden structure. So Wendy Chan um, has, has um, characterized software as logos, as something that is like the platonic logos, so to say, um, uh, um, above, uh, a kind of law, but it's not a law that humans have to interpret, 
but which is technically interpreted by the interpreter actually, or in the um, in the tra transportation process from from a software to code. And executed code is just executing without uh, humans having any say in, in how things would be interpreted. So software is very much like the platonic ideas in that regard. Uh, and always uh, hegemoniality and power are issues that are connected with software, which does not mean that uh, software generally is a bad thing or so, but we have to be aware that this is a very special text that is um, very, very different from every kind of text we had before in cultural history. So second uh, thing I would think about um, is um, what Galloway and, and Thacker called protocol logics, so that uh, uh, that uh, we have, or, or let's say data structure issues. So dealing with a software in any way means that things have to become data, right? So they, they are not data naturally. It's just not that things have data and you just take them from them, but you have to create the data. So you have to define the data structures, which again, as a process of power and institution. For example, you know, if you have these websites, we could only, when, when you want to, I don't know, open an account or what, and you have to choose if it's if it's a female or male, and there's nothing in between. So, so this is this is the power of data structure. Then you have to to choose this, uh, and uh, so this is something I think that uh, that goes together with the with the power of software. And uh, um, of course, there are two things um, to be mentioned. Then, uh, and this would be the engineering side and the economic side. So the ecologies uh, where software lives, and of course, it lives in artistic ecologies. This is why it's so important. But in, in the, of course, we talked about that just some minutes ago, uh, or it has been talked about that. Um, we have, of course, the the problems of uh, of solutionism, like uh, Evgeny Morozov calls this. So, if we have a tool. Uh, and uh, and of course we have very very powerful tools uh, um, uh, with with uh, also in, uh, in, the, in the public domain or in the in the uh, creative commons domains with software for example then these tools uh, would be taken and they would be applied to problems which not necessarily had been there before or and which not necessarily, not necessarily are important problems to us but so uh, people take just take what's there technically and do some engineering magics and uh, create stuff that that then uh, uh, looks for its market so this is i think the solutionistic logic um, of thinking how to solve problems uh, has has a third aspect of far because the question is who defines what's a problem then <laughs> it's only the engineers who have the say with regard to software who defines uh, uh, who defines what is a problem after all or at all and uh, the first aspect uh, connected to this is what uh, Shoshana Zuboff called the surveillance, surveillance capitalism so this connects of course to technologies that are not neutral in our world not only help us but that are very very concretely uh, starting to 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 become a very very huge global surveillance uh, surveillance web, um, uh, and I think there's another aspect. I will I will at, at the end I will come to this other aspect of uh, surveillance because it's it's a, a technology of making visible uh, and also making invisible, and this is of course something that can be abducted from this uh, um, capitalist realm and, uh, for example, transfer to the uh, artistic realm. So um, this is where I would start looking at AI. So um, AI is a special kind of software, right? Uh, usually software is engineered and still is engineered by, uh, by humans, mostly, I would say. There are many uh, uh, decisions taken by, by, by human actors or institutional or organization actors uh, in that regard. And uh, uh, to me, it seems that with AI, this changes um, um, a, a bit. So, well, of course, it's still uh, engineered to, to a very, very high degree. Uh, but uh, it, it already begins to deal with non-human knowledge. And I would say that we just saw, uh, St Stefan just uh, mentioned the um, Alpha uh, Go, um, uh, artificial intelligence playing Go as a very special point. And the interesting thing about that is that, uh, as you may remember, as you may already know, in 2016, Alpha Go, the first version played against one of the best Go players uh, um, uh, of the world. Where he was, I think, one of the five best Go players some years ago before he played uh, against uh, Alpha Go. And, uh, and Alpha Go beat him in two and uh, four out of five games, right? And, and this is not the important part of the story. The important part is Alpha Go Zero. So the successor, 
uh, from the year after, from 2017, which then uh, beat AlphaGo from 2016, 100 times in 100 games, 100 to zero. And why could, could it do this? It was, this was because AlphaGo had been feeded with the databases of the um, of the Go games and uh, Go players are kind of nerdy people, so they have all the historical Go games and every Go game in unified databases, and it's very easy to feed uh, an AI with that. AlphaGo Zero didn't have this human knowledge, didn't didn't have this cultural human knowledge. It just played with itself for like two weeks, and then it invented basically the game of Go or the playing strategy, uh, strategies anew and invented the historical strategies that humans have invented in the last 5,000 years also. So I think there's something about um, uh, this non-human non uh, touch that I think uh, would will, will um, sooner or later uh, lead to, um, to, to AIs more or less being an important part of programming AIs or programming other softwares and stuff like this. And I think this is a very interesting um, um, uh, fact with regard to what we are as humans and how we live as humans, right? So um, is this, this is not just a negative thing to me, as just as you mentioned, Martina, at the beginning. So I think um, it's 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 very interesting to to uh, to to look uh, for uh, what what this non-human actor, which is quite powerful, could could become quite powerful, has to say to us, what response uh, in a way. And of course, we have all these problems with like China using uh, AI technologies for a kind of super surveillance uh, system, social surveillance system. Uh, I know this, but I think we have to cultivate AI. And this is why the arts are so important to me in that regard. We have to imagine futures of AI that align with, with what we are or with what we want to become uh, as humans, right? So. One of the core questions to me is, and it's an open question to me, is is AI a kind of big mirror or is it a big other, right? Is it something that lets us see ourselves in a new way? And I think it's interesting that most of the common AIs, the early ones, uh, that, that were in the field became racist AIs within like ours, right? And this says something about ourselves. So they have been looking into all these data materials created by human. And then they were just mirroring and they became racist, right? So this is kind of mirror. But I think that AI uh, is or, or could be more than this. It could be uh, what, what uh, Jacques Lacan, the psychoanalysis, called the big other, another a new big other, so to say. So it's a, it's a radical different thing, but also a radical different thinking and sensing that then can connect to our thinking and sensing. And this, I think, is anthropologically very important about this, right? So. If I look into the fields of what AI does, and also with regard to uh, arts education, then, then I see that there are, uh, and maybe there are more, um, but, but I would find like three main, main, main fields that, that come to mind uh, to, to myself. So the first thing is uh, the, um, maybe historically also, I don't know, the, the selective, um, uh, the social selection. So AIs are working to build up algorithms that we experience on the uh, networking platforms every day that, uh, you know, like work in, in, in this case, very um, towards economical uh, parameters of optimizing the screen time and, and uh, or uh, the time that people use a platform, stuff like this, um, like, like we have in TikTok and Instagram and all these, uh, these platforms. So that's a kind of selectivity uh, uh, going on. Then, then there's also, I think, uh, a kind of, um, curative action, a curatorial action, so to say. So uh, there's, there's a different kind of selectivity where AIs begin to look upon cultural objects, to look upon cultural materials, to do their big data uh, uh, driven um, uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, um, magics with the um, uh, deep learning net networks and stuff like this. And, and within this process, new, new categories uh, to sort things and new police, so to say, uh, uh, with Rancière, set a new order of, of, of sorting and seeing things emerges. And this is interesting itself. So there's something that has a curatorial aspect. And what, what we do as a culture um, in our heart, so to say, of our culture is always to preserve, to curate, to, to select 
what what should stay, what should be left out, and stuff like this. Especially in education, right? This is our business. We have also always to decide what would we include and what would would we exclude in education processes, for example. So this is some, something I think which is uh, important. And then the generative one, the creative part that just uh, uh, Stefan showed, uh, showed us and, and also Marco. And I, I would hope that this power of AI, um, which is possibly enabling and also possibly hegemonial and possibly both at the same time, that there would be an anthropological chance coming with this. And I think this gets strong when we start to uh, get into dialogical action or transactional uh, uh, relationships with AI. And, uh, and I think there are so many chances about this if we cultivate AI in that way, for example, with regard to what we call the material term or the planetary term. So all, all our, um, our feelings, so to say, or new kind of feeling about planetary issues, if you think about Fridays for Future and stuff like this. So I would say that AI is could be really uh, this big other who gives us the science to understand the ecological, the social, the cultural dynamics uh, that we that we are now in, for example, because it can deal with all the data, with all the sensorities that are out there and interconnected. So this would be, I think, very interesting. But I also think we need to educate these AIs and the algorithms. So we need some kind of artistic as well as educational work and cooperation because these things have, a, have an intrinsic morality. Uh, not, not like we humans have, but they do perform um, uh, as they sought and as they put values uh, um, uh, onto objects and stuff like this. So there's something about this, of course. And, uh, and I think we have to really um, yeah, get into this and work upon this. And I would think that uh, especially uh, arts and arts education also uh, would provide the means for, uh, um, for, for an aesthetic access, for aesthetic ref reflexivities where our cognitive capabilities are, are really not complex enough to get what's inside, what's happening inside an AI, right? So I think the aesthetic um, access to this uh, is a quite important one. So I hope I stayed within my five minutes somehow. Sorry, that's it. Thanks a lot, Benjamin, for your very interesting um, um, yeah, overview and guide plan uh, to, to come to, to, to AI. Um, so I would like to ask Martin for his input. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you uh, for having me. And hello to everybody. Um, to my background, I only have some short uh, remarks, maybe historical ones. Uh, I did uh, some research on the, the early AI models, which were developed within the framework of early cybernetics and its visions or worldview based on feedback loops and information theory. So these were roughly speaking seen as the two basic principles guiding the cosmos creatures and mankind at the same time, intertwining them. So cybernetics was a revolutionary approach which originally emerged from the research done in World War II to calculate the moves of airplane pilot systems in action to be able to shoot them and things like that. Uh, and, and, and one of the presumptions was that the free will of a fighter pilot under fire is constrained by the physical laws of the airplane movement, as well as by his training routine. Therefore, the whole system is predictable within a window of probability, which can be calculated by means of information theory. Uh, in, in this view, man and machine blend into each other and become not distinguishable anymore. Um, and after the war, that view was established as a new universal science with the name cybernetics and the claim to control machinery and society and things like that. And well, history showed that information theory approaches are very powerful tools to calculate and model behavior of all kind. So that's in short, also uh, in very short, the basis of today's digitization or an important foundation of it. So um, maybe, maybe there's only one problem with that, that it's only calculation. And that, uh, and that is since Alan Turing's famous paper on computable numbers from uh, 1937, only one side of the matter, one could think. 
So there, there still seems uh, to be something more, which is statistically met methods could not predict, uh, namely their own genesis. Um, it, it maybe has to, to operate out or to, to perform itself. Um, although in, um, also in um, AI models, if they get creative. So nevertheless, our culture has decided to rely heavily on those cybernetic calculations and model itself after them, so to say, uh, the fusion of man and machine, uh, which has no distinct borders anymore, is not only science fiction, but science in everyday life now. Um, interestingly, as you can see uh, behind me, I put the, the picture, uh, already the early computers were often programmed by women in a kind of very specialized choreography where the bodies of the women were informed by the architecture of the machine and the operations of the machine were in, informed, so to say, by the actions of those bodies without any AI involved. Looks quite similar to the setup, uh, to the little small setups uh, Stefan has showed showed us before. <clears throat> so I also think the, I love the pieces I saw from Marco. I, I didn't see them on stage, but I yesterday I looked in, in the internet and so on. And I also think they are, they are very important as they kind of match uh, also this indistinguishability or um, this, come, uh, this melt, melting together of, of man and machine and um, address the, the questions that arise with that. <clears throat> um, well, when I was thinking about the, today's claim performing IE and what it could mean, I thought about we all perform AI, AI uh, in a sense, which indeed uh, performs only itself as it operates on statistical models of our data and their average values, which almost never correspond to any realness, but nevertheless, project and constitute realness or our reality. Um, so performing AI then means a kind of collective techno-social performance, which performs itself in a very intimate mode of technologically othered selves and man-like appearing machines. Maybe only so far. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Martin, for your straight thesis. Um, and uh, I would like now Irina to give her input. Yes, thank you. I think there's kind of um, connections to everybody, to all of your um, contributions, but I'm, I think I won't be able to make them explicitly. So I hope it resonates. So hello and thank you, Martina, for the invitation. In my short in input, I will briefly introduce my understanding of media cultures of artificial intelligence and try to relate this to some thoughts how to intervene in AI. Um, uh, I'm a bit down to earth. Um, and not with these big visions of AI, but artificial intelligence aims to construct or simulate intelligent behavior. And this means that machines or so-called agents are able to solve problems in a relatively autonomous way. This may include the ability to recognize images and text written or spoken. More generally spoken, it includes the ability to produce and collect data. Benjamin Jerison said so. And um, process it and calculate a result, even though this specific calculation has not been programmed explicitly step by step um, in an algorithm. So um, doing so, they, the artificial, the artificial intelligences, often need a so-called training or learning phase in order to adapt their processing and calculating abilities. Following on this more or less vague division, it is obvious that AIs need media. They rely on, the, they rely on images, sound, and written text as input and of course, 
they need media to represent their output to a human user if they want to or if they are supposed to um, represent their out outputs and communicate with the human user. Moreover, artificial intelligences are the object of media representation, politics and narratives in which the technology is concretized as a social object. Um, in the introduction of the um, edited volume, um, Martina mentioned my colleagues and me speaks of media cultures of artificial intelligences. The concept aims at the assemblage of media, data and science, technical operations and human practices, information and knowledge that make artificial intelligence all, at all possible. It also asked the concept also ask how such assemblages are evolving or changing with the advent of artificial intelligences. So is there a media culture evolving around specific artificial intelligence um, procedures? A little bit, where am I? Um, and, but, but, but. and of course, it includes the questions, what are the collective imaginations of artificial intelligence in different contexts? So, um, together with my colleagues, I have proposed to examine artificial intelligence and their media cultures along, along three dimensions, three different dimensions, which of course are not separated, um, but uh, work together. Um, I briefly introduced these and outlined the possibilities for interventions that they offer, in my opinion. The first dimension is to scrutinize AI along its technical development. This includes the technical materialities, as in Martin Donner's background image, <laughs> Um, um, the mathematical foundations, the algorithmic procedures and the concrete implementations of AI applications, as well as their training and the, accompan and the accompanying discourses from the field of the technical development. The second, um, the second dimension is about the history of ideas and the imaginaries of artificial intelligence. And in the historical analysis, it becomes clear that there are very, very powerful traditions along which AI is imagined. This includes, of course, the conception of what behavior is considered to be intelligent. We had the examples like, of course, calculation. Then with the Turing test, it's communication. And with the early um, things with the games, um, with the game stuff, it's like, oh, Schach is something and Alpha is uh, uh, Go is something for very intelligent human or maybe man, more or less in the history of developing AI. Okay. Um, and it's also what forms, it's not only about behavior, but it's also about what forms of actions and thus decisions this intelligent behavior does include. Um, for example, the history of ideas on AI is strongly concerned with concepts of thinking and learning, as well as autonomy, and thus with decision making and actions and <laughs> capabilities, I said so. Especially in the history of imaginary, it is an important question whether intelligent ma machines can gain consciousness and replace humans if necessary, e.g. as working humans or as loving or beloved humans. In my opinion, interventions on the level of, oh fuck, I forgot the interventions on the level of the technical development, I go back to there. In, in my opinion, interventions on the level of thinking and imagining spaces about AI are crucial. Um, these these interventions can especially be developed in media cultures of AI as they offer possibilities of performing AI. And I think like Marcos and Stefan's um, work is also going in this direction. So how we can imagine and to try to embody in Marcos, um, in, in Marcos work um, or to try to open 
spaces of not only imaginaries but of Erfahrung, I forgot the English word, um, to, to uh, events. Mm -hmm. Experience. Experience sorry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, here we are concerned with notions of man and machine and how they are distinguished or entangled. We might imagine and perform in what relations human and AIs can do what. This third dimension concerns the socio-technical realities or spe of specific AI, AI applications. Um, as there is no general AI and still until now, a, um, the processes of AI are very mathemati mathematical and also in a human range of mathematics and not already in a totally different lines of arguing or in a totally different rationality. Um, 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 we can scrutinize these kind of applications, hopefully. Um, but looking at the social technical realities of um, specific AI applications, we see that technology, human practices, and non-human operations, translations, and representations entangle and interact to take effect, to bring to the results. It seems to me that we need spaces as no negotiation zones, zones where the socio-technical realities of artificial intelligence might be tried out in participative processes. I imagine this in the sense of critical test beds or critical living labs. It would be about which problems exist, which should be worked out and whether this happens with, with AI procedures or not. It is about performing in media cultures of AI to explore the f in the first place what their socio-technical realities might be, what assemblages would be formed, what kind of decisions and agency would evolve. And thus, I think there is a possibility also to, um, to, if, to have effects on the development, on the, on the level of development, because of visually um, per se interventions are possible uh, regarding the programming, the design of the constraints of AI, as well as the used trainings data. One usual demand, I'm going back to the first uh, dimension of technical involvement and the interventions I see there because I have forgotten to read that out. On this uh, one usual demand with regard to interventions in AI is diversity. It would be used, um, um, there is a request for more diverse developer teams and or more diverse training data sets. And I think of course in this kind of socio-technical living labs, um, one, could, one could scrutinize what kind of diversity um, would have to be applied in, okay, what are the blind spots of developer team? What are the blind spots of um, training data? What is the discrimination? Re reproduced within it. Although I personally ask myself if uh, um, whether the mathematical method used, especially pattern recognition, and Martin said this, um, founding on statistical mathematics and their theory, um, Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie. Um, I ask myself if, that, if there are different approaches um, because it's a bit like it's a set of algorithms to bring AI methods working, which is more or less the same like data recognition, statistical um, things. And somehow the idea of one fits all um, I think is not, it, it seems too simple for um, the complexity of our world and the problems which are left. 
But I'm finished now. Um, I just wanted to say because Marco and also Benjamin said like there's also, um, we have to think about um, the connection of AI and um, sustainability or climate um, change problems. And I guess um, you have read the Love Lock, uh, what was it called? The new Love Lock book. That's a guy who invented Gaia. I forgot how it's called, but it's about AI and the big imaginaries and how he might think of how Earth will transform be before um, it explodes to an AI um, umbed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Irina. Um, thanks all for your wonderful and um, important statements and inputs. Uh, perhaps we, we start uh, with a, like a first round as reacting to each other, questions you got from, from the presentations, um, if you like. So the more free exchange conversation um, so. I would just jump in because, uh, yes, it was very, very wonderful like, to hear all those inputs and there are many interesting like uh, things which like where you refer to each other and it's also very interesting like to see how um, you as an art, as artist and you as like scientists like refer to AI and talk about AI. Of course, I've got many questions, but the first question uh, I wanted to pose to um, Stefan and Marco. Uh, it just popped up when Irina um, like talked about AI and solving problems, right? Because uh, yes, we use like uh, those algorithms, those software to solve problems, or at least like companies use it to solve problems. But if it comes to artistic processes, there's not this one problem which has to be solved. There you have got like your artistic concept, which you want like to, to bring on the stage, to bring like, uh, onto um, like to the listeners to the viewers and i want uh, to pose the question uh, to you stefan and to you marco when you use like ai algorithms in your artistic work do you have problems you want to solve using ai or are there problems is there just a curiosity using ai for an artistic need kind of Stefan, I think. <laughs> well, I thought, yeah, I think in my case, it might be simpler. So I don't really have problems when trying to create an artistic piece of any kind, music or experience design, whatever. I never would see AI as a problem solving tool tool in this space but that might be influenced because i'm so overwhelmed by my professional day regarding dealing with ai that i use artistic practice more as something completely different and that's why i might refuse opportunities of ai even because i'm you know uh, just in this very subjective personal state of mind. And I, as I told you, I just recently checked some available tools just out of a playful mind. And then I got uh, yeah, a little bit into it, even found it kind of pleasant. But um, the problems I have when dealing with artistic stuff like creative block. Um, I would not try to use AI to present me new ideas or something. And then regarding the, uh, the possibilities to extend my artistic tools and repertoire, um, I would say I'm not so maybe experienced as Marco, so to say, not in a stage where I really try to invent new stuff, to invent myself, 
you know, for example, I have a long tradition with electronic music, uh, keyboard playing stuff, this is my interface. So if I want to escape creative block, I could go to a drum set in a very DIY manner, apply some sensor mix, put them into the modular system, and this would even create enough freedom and, and, and space. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's because of the 30 years of professional AI experience, um, you have kind of this, uh, this look into the black box, which takes away every magic and, and every connotation. It's just mathematics and nothing else. Um, so even if it's trained on large scale stuff, it's nice, it's a little bit surprising, but not really. So the only one thing, and um, Martin stated even, uh, uh, Benjamin even stated it uh, clearer than myself, is really this alpha zero thing. I have to say a piece of very, very clever programmed mathematical, really deep stuff was learning by itself the human way of playing Go and beyond. And um, it would be interesting for me to apply such a thing, for example, to a music generating process, but this would be more kind of a scientific project and not an artistic one. Um, so that's why I always kind of in this tension, I see alpha zero in my work, and then I think, ah, oh, I could be using it at music, but it would be a scientific project. No, I want to do art, I want to express myself, I go to the drums, you know, so. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's super enlightening. I mean, it's great to have you here with this experience, because yeah, I totally understand what, what you mean, Stefan, although I don't have uh, your 30 years of experience, but I can imagine the feeling. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, uh, well, it's, it's similar and different, obviously, from Stefan, because we have different practices, but um, yeah, I, I have a, a PhD in computation, uh, and, and yeah, eventually AI is, is, is machine learning more or less efficient, which fundamentally it's, it's just a very powerful way of doing statistics. So if you ask me personally, there isn't really much anything interesting in, in that mathematics uh, from an artistic point of view. You know, I mean, of course, you can do beautiful art using mathematics. And that's, that's not what I'm saying, but especially in a practice like mine, by itself, uh, machine learning or AI are pretty useless. I mean, um, if you start making guns, then everybody does the same guns because everybody just download the same libraries. And so the, the whole scene is, is basically uh, buried alive by guns. No? So uh, that's unfortunate, but uh, that's where we are. Um, so, I mean, maybe I would turn your, your question around. I would say, I like to use AI to create problems. <laughs> so, that's that's what I try to do. So I, um, since I had also a little look into the black box, uh, as to borrow Stefan metaphor, um, then I, I like to exploit this knowledge to to hack the way different algorithm works, um, not to make them create anything new, uh, but to show to audiences. Maybe show is is among quotes, but to manifest somehow to audiences what, what these processes look like, how, how they can sound like. But it, I'm more interested in, 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 in turning inside out the processes that are at the basis of, of machine learning and so forth, rather than using them for what they are supposed to do. So for instance, in the the performances that I quickly mentioned before, especially with Front Evacuo, we use this, this AI that's based on a computer um, vision system. Um, 
And yes, sometimes we have the, this algorithm regenerating from scratch what it sees. It uses this, uh, this uh, convolutional autoencoder, um, which is a super fascinating algorithm. And it's used today everywhere from like learning text, uh, um, like written text or recognizing cancer, for instance. Uh, but it's also based on, on, on quite arbitrary notions of what an anomaly is and what normality is. So we try to hack into the algorithm to bring more to the front uh, these uh, foundations of the logic that was at the base of the creation of this, of this algorithm. And, um, now I will just pass the word on to someone else, but I've, I've got some, an idea from Buka who is reading while, while you were always speaking, so maybe later, which has to do with the norm, how norm is a central concept in statistic and how that actually come from eugenics in Victorian era. <laughs> just throw it like that. Well, stop now. Thank you so much. I think um, Benjamin, you wanted to, uh, to say something and then Irina, right? Yeah, I think this question uh, about the problem uh, solving, it's very interesting and also Marco's answer that she uses this to create problems and not to solve problems because, uh, well, you can you can win a game of AI, but you can't uh, you win a game of Go, but you can't win a game of song or, or a game of art, right? There's nothing to win. So, uh, so there, but, but of course you could you could think about um, that uh, um, even in, in artistic processes you have problem sol problem solving elements and this is more like the the paintbrush for example in painting right so paintbrush solves a problem also the paint itself solves a certain problem so we have all these cultural histories of what paint is and and there's a lot about and on this level I would say. That um, that AI would would become a kind of an actor, right? Um, uh, uh, on this on this, um, uh, um, but but the modern art itself, I would say, always like we see with Marco, uh, tends to to work with it uh, about the tools, not just with the tools, but about it. So modern art tends to deconstruct the mediality and the materialities of of its own tools very much. So, and 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 there's where the potential lies, I think, with dealing with the uh, AI um, uh, technologies in that regard. So it's just like, if we talk about problem, we should really be quite, try to be quite clear about what what, what kind of a problem for, for whom are we talking about, right? Yeah. And I would, I would think that the way that the AIs that, I, I think you're probably right that this is kind of born mathematics. It's not the kind of mathematics that is astonishing and, and, and very interesting, but it's just statistics. <laughs> Uh, just on on a massive scale, but uh, uh, it's it's also the question of how these AIs are constructed and trained. These deep learning networks, I think, are constructed and trained. So, so uh, if, if if the 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 little I know about how these things work, is that they're trained like in like in um, in the um, the heavy heuristic learning theory, right? So they 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 have pun they are are punished if they make wrong decisions. Uh, and they are they they get some, some some benefits like symbolic benefits of course from like, like points and number or what if they take right decisions in the end and and this is a very crude and simple way of thinking about learning actually and a very a very engineer way maybe of thinking about a very mechanistic way of thinking about learning and learning is much much more and I would say that if you unleash what AI could be you would get totally different things uh, and that would make Less, much less sense to engineers, but maybe much more sense to us sometimes. I think I forgot my question, but it was to Marco. Um, I have to confess, I was at the performance on Saturday, it's episode two, and I was kind of irritated. I did not exactly love it. <laughs> so I'm doing here the German bitch and ask you a couple of questions because i mean i got the point of the performance and i like to watch at you all of you as performers but um actually i was looking a lot at you because i was sitting at that part of the um part of the performance and i was asking i i somehow expected that it's more 
also because of the bion bion rhizomatic installation stuff and the text um so i thought a bit more it's more about a harvage um making kin stuff and um constructing collectives and that stuff and then i thought when i was seeing it i liked the red the red hats and i like i liked a lot of the performance okay <laughs> i like watching it i also like the sounds but i was expecting some different things not in the form as aesthetics but in the form of how ai and the performer were related because after a while i thought i did not understand the monitor stuff what you what you have explained right right now but um i was thinking hey it's no coexistence of ai and the performer but it's like these performers are it's a bit like a simulation of um leben's form of of organisms um thrown into an environment which is tact which is which is ruled by an ai Okay, because you were so hard in this, in this, in these repetition forms and with the music and then with these, okay, learning phase, pattern recognition thing. I thought it's, you know, like it's an, I felt a bit like I am somebody looking at the simulation um, um, of an evolution stuff and I recognize some okay there's some cultural patterns evolution some religious rituals blah 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 and then there is this boom of the AI coming back and the next loop and it was something like corrupted loop starting again so it felt a bit like it's it felt for me it's not about cooperation or coexistence but about you as the performers are kind of living entities who have to cope in this environment they do not so much i was at episode two so i imagine the organism do not yet know so well their environment and that stuff so yeah, now i was speaking so much but marco can you maybe say something and sorry if i'm not so nice my um in my reaction on that ah and my my question is or what i then had was like aren't you you said something like embodying so i was feeling now afterwards and in reflecting that it's somehow in the performance is somehow embodying some yeah phases of ai in uh, and this kind of simulation of evolution in a organism in an environment okay so i will try to make the answer a bit more expanded because maybe the people who, who doesn't know about the piece may may feel a bit alienated by this but um so first of all don't worry I, it, it's not it's not a piece that everyone will like and in general if that that's not a question that i'm interested in if somebody liked it or not it's it's more about the experience and um, secondly um again for the interpretation is open as well so i'm not going to tell you that your interpretation is wrong uh our, our own main concept is really that uh the audience come into this world that has already been existing forever and they will be existing forever it's totally anachronistic and uh, the ai is not dominating uh, but it's part of the ecosystem so the loop that you see the performance repeating it's the same loop of the ai of course uh, but it's also a metaphor for our lives that are always in a loop so it's a very human uh, existential problem especially within the society that we live in now the i, I like to call algorithmic societies uh, so there is a parallel between the looping of the algorithm and the looping of the humans it's not the looping of the algorithm imposing itself onto the life of humans 
Um, and all of these start from the assumption that AI is human because we made it. It just didn't fall from another planet onto us. We made it and it's very human. And that's why it, it can also be so ugly because it's very human. Uh, so it is a parallel more than an, uh, forcing onto, onto one another. And for the, for the togetherness and empathy, of course, that was a trick in the text because nobody said that the piece shows empathy or togetherness, but it shows the need for it. So it, the piece basically just, it's, it's really about interruption and because the performers are interrupted when, when they're doing the things, the, the, the AI learning is interrupted. The experience of the audience is, in, is interrupted as well um, because of a variety of mechanisms. Language is interrupted. There is no language whatsoever. Um, so it's really about, it, it's really a piece about uh, interruption and this is emphasized by, emphasized by the way the performers interact with the audience through this transparent film, which is they always interact and try to interact and audience also try to interact, but this interaction is always interrupted. And that's on purpose, again, to show the need for something else, to show you how that is frustrating. <laughs> and so how that is really something needed. Um, so that, that would be my answer to it. And I have to say also episode two, it's really the most hardcore ones. So you, you may have liked better some other episode. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but you cannot know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No work. Martina, you are raising your hand, your virtual hand. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah, if I if I may like sum up a bit, and uh, I'm very astonished <laughs> to um, the, the 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 practitioners, so to say, the the artists. Uh, in a way, you say that uh, there's not this that uh, Stefan said it's only mathematics. Um, we need another um, forms of artificial intelligence to make it interesting, but. And uh, there's this interest in in AlphaGo Zero as a, as a, as a concept and, and a technology and uh, technological procedures to um, AI learning from the humans and then learning by themselves. So hmm, this is for, for for the questions that we put for for today's episode about the agency. So it seems that there's not so much agents. There's a lot of agency, but it's not coming from perhaps from the AI as such, but a lot from the humans. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, when, when Marco said that we need something else and this should be shown. And then if you have the model from Benjamin, that's uh, the, the AI as a mirror, perhaps it was uh, Marco's answers to Irina's question is uh, that was all the mirroring concept the, the, uh, and the AI as, as a big other. Um, and um, and then I remember Martin today saying that uh, it's it's uh, it's only pro uh, probability and it's statistics, uh, cybernetics, um, and uh, it's only like performing the systems themselves. And if the human is in, that's they are performing themselves. So this is um, hmm, what the fuck <laughs> AI? Yes, <laughs> nice idea, but. Uh, if I take Benjamin, we have to come to the big other. Yeah, my question for, for Benjamin, for example, was all this uh, solutionism uh, and uh, hegemo this hegemonial patterns and and orders we have. This is coming from the humans. This is coming from from the ugliness because it's a human. You said it's racist. Um, um, Irina said we need another mathematics, perhaps, uh, to have. Um, to have another AI. Um, uh, so if we don't have the mirror concept, but if we see the, the AI as a big other, and you said, Benjamin, that the artist could be our way to this, 
they could inform us. For, for me, Be uh, Marco's performances is uh, they have this uh, ideas of posthuman empathy, posthuman relationships, and this ugliness, this destruction, this solutionism, as what Benjamin, this mirroring and the big other. Um, if we have, if we stop the mirroring, do we stop also the hegemonial aspects? Should now artists do AI and uh, how could we fight the owners of the mirror concept, which are Google and uh, all the big companies? It's a question of economy. Um, so still I'm with the question, what is the agency of AI and, and what could be the interventions? And can we come out of that, what Martin said, it's till now it's only statistic. If we make too much feedback loop in art, are we then re repeating, repeating this um, performing just for, for oneself or performing just themselves? This, um, yeah. That's but, but I would say it's 2022. And um, even in this small round of people, I would say we could have kind of this agreement um, yes, we built this mirror AI, and I had a lot of times when people ask, um, you have been so long in AI, what have you learned, what will you do, blah, blah, blah. I always said, when you deal with AI, you learn a lot about human mankind, and that's why I enjoyed, I enjoyed the ride. Even that I don't like to apply AI in my private life, on artistic stuff, etc. But by dealing with it, you know, for example, it's, it's a very obvious example. Before all these uh, violations of uh, face recognition stuff by trained with bias, et cetera, came up, it came up because we applied deep learning with wrong training sets. And then it was on the agenda. And then things had to happen, you know, for the better. So there are meanwhile regulations. Um, that uh, inventors of AI and uh, people applying it have to deal with it. Um, and for the other, I would say by having this strange alpha zero thing, you can see already the other. So I was really shocked, you know, for, for years and decades, I was only always the guy telling people, don't be afraid, AI, come on, it's copying, it's mirror, it's nothing. Yeah, it's impressive uh, if you don't know the inner working, but they can't take it easy. Um, but with this thing, I still did not manage after four years to get through this 30 pages original paper because I'm not very good at mathematics. I, I somehow managed to go along with it, but it's full of it. And um, if you see then, okay, it has all the traditional Go rules learned by itself, plus some extra. And it's only these 30 pages of mathematical stuff. Then I think I should go into it. You know, I should deal with it. I, I want to understand it. And um, the other way around, and I would say this is what um, Marco and others do in, in the very active artist scene. If you look at the use of AI in contemporary art, which is interesting, it's only the one which is hacking. It's only the one dealing with critical topics. Come on, I mean the, the next Rembrandt and all this shit sponsored by Telecom, etc. The uh, composing Beethoven, the, the symphony, blah, blah. I mean, everybody is not really interested in this. <laughs> no serious artist is interested in these things, you know? applying the mirror in art, that's, that's really boring, you know? But, but I would say we are on track. We have active artists, hacking, dealing, trying to invent. We have this Alpha Zero by the evil Google DeepMind team, but, you know, they show already the other. And there are researchers such as me and others who try to keep on track and, and see what this means. And for all these violations with bias stuff in deep learning systems, we have already first upcoming regulations. We have machine ethics committees. It's not like the shit is going on and on and on and on. Um, yeah, but I mean, we for sure we have all the effects like the 
Facebook filter bubble, which is creating huge, huge feedback loops on societal discourse, which is already happening and mind shaping for sure. I think Martin, you raise your virtual hand uh, and maybe then Benjamin. Uh, yes, uh, some remarks uh, there, there was. Maybe this uh, AI as a mirror also corresponds with a symbolic approach to AI. So uh, there are other approaches. There were in the beginning, and I think there will be again with the maybe quantum information theoretical stuff in the future or something. So um may, may, maybe it corresponds quite a much because ashby had had this homeostat thing and he he uh, was a bit uh, laughing about the symbolic approach to ai uh, of his time and said okay well maybe there are some physical laws we or we don't know let's put materialities together and dance together if you want so and 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 act out for themselves electromagnetic fields and stuff like that and then the outcome isn't maybe um calculate calculable uh, it's not calculation anymore it's kind of really acting out performing if you want so um that that, that was one point um, so maybe this this strong uh, notion of uh, mirror of humans uh, corresponds to that symbolic approach um, and then um, I, I, I found it quite interesting that that um, the machines if they learn for themselves even with the AlphaGo thing it has to be acted out it, it's not um, um, like in a Platonian idea wo ideal world uh, it's not there in the beginning and and uh, already, but it has to act out in real world, and and this this I find quite interesting. So AI needs us to 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 learn and also to to uh, or needs its environment um, uh, to learn, and uh, that it, environment has to be something else than that AI if it's a symbolic one, and that's uh, quite interesting uh, to me. So there is the other side of the medal I talked about with, with the Turing paper. So um, there, and, and this is quite interesting to me uh, to think about that. And then uh, the third one, uh, what I felt about the Mar Marcus work also, where, where does the feeling of violence come from if we perceive it? So if we perceive those systems, there is a feeling of violence to me. Uh, speaking out of that work and it's quite fascinating to me it also reminded me a bit of the work of Giger uh, or the aesthetics of Giger in, in, in some points um, who, who I also love so I, I, I was asking myself where does this feeling of violence come from what what is it that affects us in in seeing those kind of assemblages thank you Yeah, right. I, I'd, I'd like I like this uh, this response, Martin. But 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 my but mine is less philosophical. I have to I have to admit. I, I just wanted to um, uh, to very very friendly oppose the optimism of Stefan. Stefan just uttered um, because I, I think we have to we have to see just the the, the contexts uh, in uh, the, the the bigger picture in which we are um, put in, so to say. And I, I think thing is that. Uh, that the uh, the very efficiency of AI in a world that uh, that turned to be a world of problem solving uh, of, of solutionism really it's it's not just an, a digital thing this solution is a thing that grew up from the 19th century um, at the latest it's it's a thing of enlightenment in a way also so there's a problem that solve it right this is the, the dialectics of enlightenment on a new stage I would say in a way so um and in a world where uh, where the the, um, the 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 raw efficiency of what AI does in all its limitations is where, uh, but but the, it's enough, right? It's enough to to replace human work in, in, in many places. It's enough to um, to create money uh, in the internet. If, if I if I have all these automatically written sports uh, articles, sports news, 
articles, then they are not human paid, humans paid for, for this. And uh, you, if, could, you could imagine that, of, of course, AI is uh, it's just statistics, but in this single outcome, it can may appear as very, um, as very uh, creative, right? And if you are in a creative industry where you have to, not the arts, but the creative industries, where you have to create like like in Fordism, where every every day you have to get five ideas, uh, and and sketch them out, then uh, the AI will become an actor because it's cheaper, and maybe it will be better in a way. It will be more market oriented than what humans do, and 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 this I think um, will will create a situation where this kind of, of AI will be there actually and will be very, very dominant and will be developed. So uh, interesting question is who in, in the whole economic field would give just one million or two million dollars or euros to, to create um, an alternative approach to AI. But they are paying like, like billions and trillions to create these kinds of AI. So I think we have to be aware that we are a little bubble here, <laughs> that right, that 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 uh, that that has import. It's it's not that that's not important what's been done, uh, especially in the arts. I would say, it is important, but we have to be aware that there's a political fight that's still there. We can't replace this with arts or education. So we have to we have to be aware that these players aren't, aren't, aren't playing fair, by the way. So so uh, even if we have now the algorithm watching other stuff, China doesn't care. And China is building the algorithms for education. Um, based on mass surveillance and AI, they are building educational, um, um, educational algorithms, which I would suppose will be very efficient in like five to 10 years. And we will buy them. We will just pay them money to give up these algorithms in order to 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 use this in our schools for example because it's so efficient and it makes teaching cheaper and and stuff like this it's not it's not only surveillance it's of course it's always uh, also surveillance but it's uh, also this this kind of of brute efficiency of what uh, what these systems can do for example if you have like like a classroom with 40 pupils 40 students then the average teacher will, will not be able to, to analyze a single problem like, like a, di a pedagogical or diagnostic or psychological diagnostics if one single student has a problem. But AI, AI will be able to do this. It will be able to say, well, this, this student is not bad in English because he doesn't get it. He's bad because he has this kind of symptom characteristics. And you can see it by his eye move movements, by, the, by his uh, uh, nutrition intake and, and uh, stuff like this. So you can just... Uh, see the pattern, so to say, and uh, and and have a better education using these algorithms that are built up by mass surveys in China. So I think there's something about this uh, that we have to face that that uh, that uh, AI is itself a performer in a different sense. Well, it's performing in that way uh, of economic performance and efficiency. I just wanted I <laughs> didn't want to. Um, to 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 curb our enthusiasm here, but I just wanted to bring that to mind. That uh, I think that there's uh, these are actual fights and struggles that have to be uh, fought. It's a very very interesting aspect, Marco. You are raising your virtual hand you want to talk <laughs> yeah, thank you um yeah maybe just keep keep just to keep commenting on this on this flow of ideas from from martin and benjamin um and also picking up the uh the other comments before so obviously you know obviously nothing is only black and nothing is only white so it, it it's all in um in this axis of gray areas and um i think from an artistic point of view i think we need both optimism pessimism and anything in between um for my personal work and for the kind of person and for the kind of artist that i am i i tend to do the the things that are kind of put over on a side because they're a bit more harsh to do. Uh, but that's just my nature and I'm not doing it because I think in some kind of justness of, uh, 
of a heavy heart or something, just the way I am. Um, but I do think that the violence uh, that is at the base of capitalism is embodied in the modern models of artificial intelligence. And not only that, coming back to the feedback loops, because this model, this present model, so deep learning, uh, autoencoders and all that kind of stuff, because these models are engineered mostly by people paid by capitalist corporation, they are designed with a certain mindset, uh, which is total efficiency and super uh, excellent performance and so forth, which, which are the tenets of capitalism. And uh, these in turn has just made the capitalists more rich than they were before and more greedy for whatever else they can get because that's what capitalism does. Uh, and so now we are really, I think, at, at some kind of, of peak of, of neoliberal liberalism, where some says we are coming back to feudalism. I think it's a lot worse than that, honestly. And um, so I find it quite difficult to talk about this modern model of AI in a positive way, because um, I'm not so hopeful that we can change society through this technology specifically. Then AI itself, as, as Martin mentioned, there was a symbolic approach of the early 60s. And, and that was super interesting. There were some great ideas there. Uh, but that has almost nothing to do with, with deep learning models of today. And, and so personally, I see AI as the embodiment of, uh, of the society that we need to change. Um, that is my take on it. So I, I hope I express myself well. It, it's really specifically about the technologies that, that are used today and, and how they have been developed rather than against artificial intelligence as a concept or, or anything. Hmm. No, you were very precise. I once said there is no objective AI algorithm in capitalism because this is by design not possible. The algorithm just improves itself up on the ingredients and the ingredients are, the app has to be sticky, people have to be around, etc. And then he just tries to maximize this. And yeah, in the end, there is the filter bubble and the endless loop of stuff we like and willing to pay to, etc. And there is no need to invent new algorithms. Yeah, it's... <laughs> inside the box of capitalism, not possible to escape. Um, if I can end up... Oh, sorry, Martin, no, you go ahead. Uh, uh, no, sorry, only a, a short remark. I, I didn't mean that specific symbolic approach. I mean, I meant mathematical models when I said symbolic approach. So uh, there, there are different kinds of uh, deep learning stuff and, and things. Um, or, or a symbolic approach, but I meant the whole mathematical approach to it. So there were also physical approaches to 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 it, and that was the difference I, I wanted to make. Um, and and uh, well, it's only an op optimization problem. Then uh, the whole thing, I think, the the deep learning stuff, it's all about optimization, and therefore I, I see it similar like you. Um, with a with a it, it sticks to capitalistic logics if you want so or is intermingled with them and uh, that's the big uh, question how to go further from that point so um, yeah yeah I just wanted to add something also now I think it's good to see this this perspective or at least for me, in order to cope with the world, because I find that incredibly difficult during these times, I I, I like to imagine that at some point uh, there will be other engineers, other people, other hackers, other citizens, whoever, who take up coding and start imagining, because you need imagination, something what that Benjamin mentioned, that a, a, a different way of learning for machines that is not based on this principle. 
and that it's it's possible i mean we we already if we are already able to verbalize it now it means that it's already possible it's just that nobody has either the resources the willingness or whatever to do it um, and I think that again, artists, uh, at least in the Occidental world, have the freedom to do uh, pretty much whatever they like. And I think this is really a, a good direction to take instead of becoming the slaves of Google and using TensorFlow for anything and sell it to the market. You know, it, um, but again, the real problem here is not the algorithm, it's human nature, <laughs> in my opinion, or at least human nature of the most, um, yeah, or the richest, depends. Martina, you raise your virtual hand. Yep, that's, I would propose because, um, uh, as moderators, we also have to look for the time. The, the discussion is super interesting and exciting. Uh, and so um, Ilya and me, we, we wanted to post something to come to an end. But before doing so, I, I would propose that Benjamin gives it, his, his, in, his, his input. Just a short answer to Marco. I think yeah, that's wonderful what you're saying. And I think, I think we, would, we, we need new alliances. Um, because from my view, of course, it's my professional view, education is, it's, it's really, it's really um, you have really leverage with, with education and societies, well, how education thinks, what it does, stuff like this. So, so I think we need, we need this kind of new alliances, which is not easy to achieve, but I think very much needed, where um, this kind of technologies takes a different place in education than it does now. So it, 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 in Germany, it does not really, it's not really important because informatics is not such a huge school subject. But, uh, but, but even then, it, it should be uh, uh, opened up to people to gain this kind of approach, alternative approach to these kinds of, uh, of technology in order to give at least the idea that this kind of, of, of empowerment with regard to, uh, to, to AI um, or software in a, in a more generalized uh, view is possible. So I think there, there are new alliances necessary between, between the arts, the artists, uh, and education, I think so. Because there's really a lot to learn, uh, which we don't understand. But we are the ones who have to give this, for example, in, in teacher education, which I do on a, on a daily basis, right? Uh, my job is teacher education, so I teach them about media education, stuff like this. But this this is knowledge I would need to, to give them a glimpse about how would they, they would uh, to, to, to find a position towards what they will experience when they are uh, in the job in 10 years or so. And uh, th this is, uh, I always think we, we, we really have to move in that direction uh, somehow to bring this more together because the arts education, I'm speaking for arts education, is not so much artistic in every regard, actually, not, not at least not, not so much with regard to, uh, to, to this kind of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of new approaches, to this kind of, uh, of avant-garde approaches, if you want to, because it's too complicated. So if you think about an art school for children, how would you implement this? It's, it's a long way, right? But in a way, we, we need this kind of moves, I think, uh, in order to, um, to, 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 to really, um, to really find a more efficient, uh, um, find more efficient means um, to uh, to to um, to get this these ideas heard, seen, and practiced. Yes. Thanks a lot, Ben. I mean, this is like a bridge for the proposition Ilya and me wanted to to make for 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 the end. This is uh, we have uh, we have the. Um, pessimist, the optimist, the black and the white, and so on, so on. So we had the capitalist vision and the mirror vision, the, the stupidity and the nastiness and the ugliness of, of the humans, which is today in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And we have the big other. So our proposition is to, to finish with a positive way. Benjamin started in a way, we, we, you can follow up, but uh, some concrete ideas images, pictures, uh, I don't know what, uh, associations um, to, to the big other. Benjamin said, uh, 
perhaps we should educate uh, artificial intelligence. Perhaps artificial intelligence should educate us to the nasty us, to, to the, the ugliness, <laughs> yeah, to, to, to the uh, unlearning uh, our ugliness, <laughs> who knows? But uh, for, for example, when I read uh, the papers from uh, Stefan Rieger and Ina Polinski about the post-species turn, for me, this was mind blowing. I thought, wow, imagine an interface for animals. Media are not only for humans, they say. And it's not the post human, like in feminist research, oh, we will save the world and uh, the human should be different. But it was, so, it was so very concrete. And it made getting other ideas about the human, other ideas about uh, aliens, uh, uh, aliens. Uh, so this is, would be our proposition, a sh short image <laughs> about the, 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 the big other, the big other of artificial intelligence to, to give us a way working together as scholars. We have also a task as scholars, as artists, as education people, if you like. Martin. Yes, Martin, please. <laughs> well, only only short one. Um, two ideas, maybe. The, the one is that if there would be an optim optimum algorithm, then the story would be finished and, and capitalism too. So it, it can't be. And it has to evolve. It, it has to go somewhere else. And we are in the, mid in the midst of it, I think. Um, and also, um, I think that they are evolve new kind of subjectivities. They they because the the straight old school capitalist one is deconstructed by those technologies. I'm quite sure about that. Even if it's the core, uh, um, if if it seems to be the core of capitalism, it also uh, gets deconstructed and it goes somewhere. I don't know where, but uh, I think change will stay. So I'm. Hope, hope uh, will stay. Thank you so much, Marco. So this is a very tough question because I'm really the least optimistic guy around here. So, but <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, coming back to education, I think maybe, especially what Martin just said. So maybe the answer is not even in the algorithms anymore. But if, if it would be possible to, to develop education systems or mechanisms or strategies where, where since childhood, human beings can become more attuned to the world around them and the other creature living in them and the ecosystems that we inhabit and so forth, then maybe when they start facing algorithm, they have a more varied toolkit to understand it, no? Because I feel also that, I don't know, maybe this sounds uh, too romantic, but I, I, do, I do think that a lot of people is missing tools to understand AI, but they're not missing the technical tools. They're missing tools of, of humanness, like, right? you know, most people can't talk about climate change because it's too hard for them. And I understand it, but how that happened? No, that can I think that the problem is before now. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe that could be also something good, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so. I, my only idea is education too. And I think the contact points are excellent because Spotify, TikTok, et cetera, is around every kid's noise. If you get it to the schools, if you get it to the teachers, and if they are educated, for example, by guys like me, I mean, it's super easy to explain AI. It's really not difficult, but um, you need people who are willing and experts to bring it to such a basic kit of being very easy to teach and then bring it to the teachers and there to, to the children and to the young people. 
um, because at the moment this knowledge is just missing and even the people who have to teach are missing it because we have all this hype and craziness about uh, what is possible and the, the movies, the science fiction, the press, the catastrophes, etc. And um, for example, there are initiatives like AI for the good, AI for the planet. We have at our institute a complete research group dealing with AI for the planet, where it is exactly about applying deep learning to flood prediction, et cetera. Um, but um, yeah, this is still in its infancy, yeah. Um, although it would be already the time to start immediately to, to teach people about it. Thank you. As a short image, uh, what I do imagine um, institution, institutionalized living labs, I call it like, like this, where um, people, these different experts of the everyday um, would um, uh, discuss together what's, what's the, what are the problems and the aims, and then um, they try to, or they can play around or and uh, so discussing, having experts, having hackers or programmers, then erproben, make, make um, prototyping. It's prototyping in a way. It's prototyping about where could AI be used, for example, for things like circular um, economy, like short liefer, uh, short um, lieferketten. Sorry, I'm getting to go to speak English now. Um, but somewhere you think like, wow, yeah, maybe it's not really sinful that we import um, potatoes um, the same in the same um, in the same menge as we export then chips. You know, like we export um, potatoes to England, to Britain, and we import chips from Britain. So maybe there could be some um, optimizing in the in the transport chains, which then would be less pollution and that stuff. So I think there are problems which might be solved with very simple optimization, um, rational logics, but most of the problems might be, have to be asked or have to be put. And um, the question is who is, who, in which forms um, the problems are evolved or are the questions, are die Fragen werden gestellt. Um, um, the problems are überhaupt formulated. The problems are formulated and the questions are posed. The way, the way they are posed is also an um, important way. And um, so it's not short, but the image is there should be um, the possibilities to do so. Sorry. Thank you, Benjamin. Do you want also to like end up with a last image? <laughs> no, no roundup of my round. The roundup I already gave. I just want to say thank you. I think this was just so inspiring to talk to you. That's the last thing I'd like to say today. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Uh, in the name of the Respect for Net Theater channel, 